in the name of the one who loves us, the one who saves us, and the one who spurs us ever on. Amen. Please be seated. A few years back, just as I was preparing to turn the lights off after a 5 p.m. Saturday evening service, a woman and her five children walked into the church. I was surprised given that we had the time of the service out front. So I explained to her that we had just finished our service, but I would be happy to offer prayer and share communion with her and her family. She said that would be lovely. And after we had completed a short communion service and were leaving the church, she asked if she could pray for me and for our community. She prayed a simple yet beautiful prayer that filled me with such joy that in that moment I felt the love of God and the care of God in a very visceral and profound way. It was very powerful. And I imagine that many of you have had that kind of experience when someone in the moment has personally prayed for you. Experienced that once again this morning as we were waiting to begin. In our gospel reading from John, we witnessed something similar in the intense prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples. It is one that is meant to help his disciples remember who they are and to who they belong in a time of disequilibrium that they will soon face following Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. And I believe that Jesus knew his disciples were going to go through a lot, that they would experience fear and anxiety, confusion, and maybe even forget just a little of what he had taught them. And so he offers them this prayer to sustain them and to carry them during the transition that is before them. Transitions can be unsettling. And while the transition that both you and I will experience is certainly not of the magnitude the disciples experienced, it is a transition nonetheless. And it is fraught with those same feelings of anxiety, confusion, maybe even a little fear. That's all part of being human, friends. Peter even reminds us of this in the words of the epistle this morning. He says, cast your anxiety on me. Cast your anxiety on the Lord. You know, these last weeks, as I've been cleaning out my office and making preparations for your new interim rector, Reverend Mary, I've been thinking about what I would say to you all today, as well as praying for your future here at St. John's. And while I would like to say that most thoughts that I've had have revolved around spiritual matters, truth be told, some of my focus has been on more personal and concrete matters, like what do I do with all these books that I've collected over the years? Who could possibly use all the paper clips that are in my desk? And I hope we've closed down some of the pandemic Zoom accounts. In my preparation for today, I did wonder what Jesus was feeling as he readied himself to leave the world. What were his concerns? Did he experience any anxiety or worry? That's where I found myself this week. And while Jesus knew exactly what to say, my prayer has been, Lord, what words do I offer? What do your beloved people of St. John's need to, to help them move forward? How do I remind them of their mission and encourage and prepare them for the future? Will it be enough? Will it be the right thing? And please keep me from breaking any more arms or ankles this weekend. <laughs> but in response, I got an almost audible reply. 
Anne, this isn't about you. I've got it covered. Just look at my word. Look to Jesus. He's been here long before you came to St. John's and will be there long after you leave. That will tell them all that they need to know. The truth of that hit me especially in light of the reading that's appointed for today in Jesus' prayer for his disciples. And it's for us as well. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, the message of Jesus' prayer, spells this out so beautifully. I invite you to please indulge me as I read a portion of his paraphrase. He writes, Father, it's time. Display the splendor of your son, so the son in turn may show your bright splendor. You put him in charge of everything human, so he might give real and eternal life to all in his care. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. What you have assigned me to do, I have done. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence even before there was a world I was with you. I spelled out your character in detail to those you gave me. They were yours in the first place. Then you gave them to me. They know now beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave to them. And they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. And I pray for those that will come. And I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. My life is on display in them. My life is on display in them. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me. So they can be one heart and mind. One heart and mind. As we are one heart and mind. Friends, throughout his ministry, Jesus never focused on himself, but pointed to the reconciling love of God and modeled what it means to be the church. And it has been my experience that we meet God most profoundly when we point to God in worship, in our care for one another, when we put aside our own desires, and when we act as one to be part of God's reconciling love. And I think that here at St. John's, we get that right most of the time. But I believe it is well for us, and particularly during this time of waiting and discernment that lies ahead, to simply say to one another, if for no other reason than to keep the truth clearly before us, that we are God's people. We are God's people. And God is in the midst of us. We are not on our own. And our primary purpose is to love God and one another, to be God's people, praying, caring, serving, pointing to and set apart in Christ Jesus. And it is this kind of kingdom living, this community-minded living, that where we find joy and completeness, purpose and belonging. So as both of us begin this time of transition, let Jesus' final prayer to his disciples be a reminder to you that God is doing something new and be open to whatever that might be. God's story is never over. God has invited all of us to continue the story of the good news of Jesus in and through our lives, in and through this place, my beloved St. John's community. Through our words and actions, through the 101 opportunities in the days and months ahead to be an answer to the prayer that Jesus offered before his death and resurrection, we are partners 
in God's continuing story of love for the world, the world that God created, the world that God said was good. Finally, beloved, as this process of transition unfolds, I enjoin you to be patient and at peace with one another. Be patient with your leadership and always think the best of one another's intentions. Empowered by God's spirit, you have everything you need to head into the future that God has planned just for you. When Peter and Andrew and James and John left behind their fishing boats, they weren't completely sure of what the future held. But even so, they went. They went. And they did that because they had trust in what they had seen Jesus do and what he said, and they had faith in that. They trusted that Jesus, God his Father, had a future in mind for them that was far greater than anything that they could know or imagine. Friends, it's the same for all of you here at St. John's. When we have faith and when we trust in God's love, we're able to say goodbye to what's comfortable and familiar, to embrace change and head out in new directions, Because we know that God's spirit is with us. Today, as I say goodbye to all of you, while not easy, I take with me memories of a community whose witness of Christ's love is making a difference in the world. I take with me the joys and sorrows, hopes and dreams that we have shared. And I take with me trust that through God's grace, Some of the seeds that we have planted together will grow and will bear fruit long after all of us are gone. I especially want to thank today my colleagues, especially Reverend Stephen, Father Joe, for what an amazing, amazing ministry I was able to share with them. For all those that bring worship to you each week, for our vestry, our commission heads, all of you, have made this time exceedingly blessed. Please know that St. John's will always have a special place in my heart. And also keep in mind that goodbye is really a word of blessing. Goodbye originally was a contraction for God be with you. So today I say goodbye. God be with you. And I invite you to join me in saying hello. Hello to a new day, to a new beginning that God has envisioned for all of us.